It's your boy, Akinola Disu. And Chuck T's. And this is another episode of Driving While Black. Thank you for riding with us as we navigate the black experience. What up, Chuck? Man, what's good, my brother? Oh, man, I'm blessed and highly favored, brother. How you feeling? Man, another day, another dollar. Can't complain. We just going to keep it pushing, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. That's the model, man. But again, thank y'all for riding with us. We're in beautiful, sunny California, Los Angeles, California, to be exact. And, uh, yeah, we're here with another episode. Uh, today, we're going to be reviewing, uh, we're going to be doing another movie review. And another one. And an- another one. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, Judas and the Black Messiah. Yes, sir. So yes, that sir. just dropped, uh, when did that drop? Like Friday, right? Uh, yesterday. Yesterday. Saturday. I think, it, I think it was Friday. Either way. Uh, but yeah, yeah, either way, it just dropped. Uh, we just watched it yesterday, last night. So, um, you know, it's pretty fresh. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was a deep movie. It was a good movie, man. What'd you think? Yeah, man, it's it's uh, it's pretty dope because we've had some back-to-back, some good movies that come out. You yeah, know, we yeah, had yeah, One yeah. Night Miami. We had uh, the other movie we talked about, American Skin. Absolutely, absolutely. And now we got Judas and the Black Messiah, and it, and it, and it kind of goes together in a way, but... The movie was phenomenal. Yeah. Um, was the acting, um, Daniel Kuliye, Kou, Kou, I don't know how to say his I don't know how to say his name. last name. But the yeah. guy from Get Out. He and Black a, Panther. He did a great job playing Fred. He did Fred. an amazing job. Amazing job. You know, uh, like we spoke about before we got on here, is uh, there was controversy that him being from Europe, that he shouldn't really play an American character. Yeah. But when you watch him on screen, you... You, you feel like he's Fred Hampton. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I remember, yeah, watching an interview with Samuel Jackson, and Samuel Jackson was basically saying, why are we, I think after Get Out, it's like, why are we going to um, England to get these um, actors to play black Americans when we have black American actors that are more than capable of playing these roles? Um, so there is a little bit of, of controversy there, but, man, his acting was on point. Oh, yeah. It was on point. It was on point, man. He he delivered. He delivered for sure. Yeah, yeah it, it, it was dope. Um, Lakeith Stanfield, he was great, even though he was a, a, a hated character. Yeah, I you mean, f- it's interesting because I think Lakeith, yeah, he's a, he's a great actor. He was great in uh, Get Out. He's great in, I don't know if you've seen ATL. Not ATL. I, Is I, it ATL? Uh, yeah, ATL. ATL. Atlanta, yeah. the show. Atlanta, the show, yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen a little bit of it, but he was also in... Um, <clears throat> It was kind of like a weird movie. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, the name yeah, I watched it. that movie too. Where he was like, uh, he was a call center worker or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I seen that movie too. Yeah, he's a good actor. He's a little bit on the kind of weirder side in terms of like roles and things like that. But mm-hmm. he, he's, he's a. I think he does well every time he touches the screen. But um, it was interesting because at the end of the day, he played a snitch. He was in a snitch. He was an informant. Um, but you kind of feel. For some reason, you don't really look at him like that. You look at him because I was on, I was on the way driving here, and I was like, man. But at the end of the day, he was put in a certain situation in a predicament where he was cho- he, where he had to choose between you know his livelihood and going against um, you know Fred Hampton. But that's but I'm like, that's a snitch. That's what a snitch is. <laughs> you know what so, I mean? Yeah. What the movie did, the movie humanized him. Right, it, it humanized yeah, yeah. him, and you're able to, to like you said, un- kind of understand his situation. Like, yo, right. if I don't do this, I'm going to prison right. for five years. Right. So you could see he had that struggle and that battle within himself. Yeah. You know, with what he was doing, and and, and I ultimately, think, yeah. snitch. <laughs> and I think too, he didn't understand um, the magnitude of what he was doing at the beginning, because mm-hmm. I think he was just a petty thief. He was trying to, you know, steal a car. He was trying to, you know, come up on some money. Uh, so I remember that scene where the FBI agent asked him, like, hey, were you upset when Malcolm X died? Were you upset when Martin Luther King died? And he was kind of perplexed by the question, but you could tell based on his response, he was just kind of indifferent. Mm-hmm. Like he wasn't, um, he, he didn't come, he didn't have the same um, kind of, he didn't stand on the same moral code as Fred Hampton. 
Right. He was just a petty thief. He was just trying to make it make it up out of his situation. Do or say whatever it takes to get up out in front of the FBI agent. Right, right. So it was it was basically one of those things where he's like, man, I. I I don't know why you're asking me this. I don't, I don't. I didn't really feel any type of way either way. When Malcolm X or Martin Luther King died, I was kind of upset. Um, so at that moment, he, the FBI agent knew that I could use this guy mm-hmm. to infiltrate the Black Panther Party. He wasn't someone that was like, nah, fuck that. I stand for this, uh, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so at that moment, they knew they could use him to infiltrate. Um, and I don't think he... And I think he, in that moment, um, Lakeith Stanfield or Bill O'Neill was just like, I'm just doing this out of survival mode. Um, they want me to take down this dude, whatever. But I think it wasn't until he actually started getting close to Fred Hampton and getting kind of, um, you know, closer to the, the Black Panther Party and what they were about and what they were doing in the community. I think at that point, somewhere in that, he realized, oh, shit, I'm really going against something positive. I'm really going against... Um, a movement that is is for my people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, while he was in front of the FBI agent in that room, he told him, don't feel bad because the Black Panther Party is no different than the KKK. Yeah. So KKK, they do a lot of evil things. Black Panthers do the same thing as well. So don't feel any type of way that these people look like you. Right, exactly. And, and feel like you have to, you know, join up with them. You're not. You're a snitch. You're an informant. And if you don't do what I say, you got five years on your head. Yeah. So I guess he, the, the FBI agent pretty much sold him on the idea of he he was doing a good thing, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, these people are essentially uh, sold him on the fact that these people are it's a terrorist group. Mm-hmm. Um, again, like you said, no different than the KKK. So he went in thinking maybe, you know, I'm potentially saving my life. And why wouldn't I? Because I'm potentially doing a good thing. Right. Uh, but then he quickly realized, you know, all the good things the Black Panther was, the Black Panther Party was doing for the community, you know, right. setting up programs for the kids, breakfast programs, um, trying to mobilize uh, their communities, you know, regardless of color, mm-hmm. which I think was powerful. Um, they started, uh, well, Fred Hampton in, Chicago, in Illinois, they started the Rainbow Coalition, which kind of um, brought together the different gangs, the different um you know, uh, organizations, regardless of, you know, race. They brought together white people, Puerto Rican people, uh, opposing gangs, just to fight, uh, you know, the system, for fight police brutality uh, and different things like that. So, right. Um, yeah, the yeah. main the main point, you know, that the Black Panther is known for is, is they were exercising their Second Amendment rights to bear arms. Mm-hmm. And they believe that as long as we're, we can exercise our right to bear arms, we have power in the struggle. Right, we can because protect ourselves. Because at the end yeah. of the day, if you remember, there was a scene where Fred Hampton was <laughs> talking to the, the audience, and he was like, ain't no dashiki going to save you yeah, when yeah. the bullet comes. Right, right, right. Like, yo, we, we got we to gotta have guns. We got to right. be able to fight back. Because right. at the end of the day, we could pray and, and do voodoo and all this and, and all these different things. But at the end of the day, when that gun comes into play... What are you going to do then? Right. We got to be able to protect ourselves. We got to be able to protect ourselves, our family, our kids, our loved ones, our people. Right. And from there, you saw in the movie, the dude in the dashiki walked out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, that dude probably felt like, damn, I got a dashiki on. I'm I'm going to go find the witch doctor. Fuck fuck, fuck the gun thing. But it just showed you kind of like the mentality. And everybody there was on code. Like, yep, you're damn right. Yep, we need the guns. Yep, we need it. We need to be intelligent. We need to... You know, understand the law, and um, it's uh, it's it's just amazing how you have this positive movement, and this positive movement is looked at as a negative to the eyes of the FBI, and it's a threat. Of course. And I know we're going to talk about a uh, Cointel Pro, yeah, and how how they use Cointel Pro to pretty much take down the Black Panther Party. Absolutely. And I think it was interesting in reading up on the movie, it's not really... It's Fred Hampton, um, Daniel Coolio, how, how you pronounce his last name, he is actually a supporting actor. So the, the, the actual star is Lakeith Stanfield, and it's the story is told, 
I guess, from the eyes of Bill O'Neill, who was the informant. Um, and I guess um, what the writers were trying to um, illustrate is the fact is 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 highlight Cointel Pro, the fact that the FBI um, and Cointel Pro stands for Counterintelligence Program. These are um, programs and initiatives that were created by the FBI um, in the '60s to take down, um, you know, black uh, power movements. Um, socialist movements, um, organizations, um, and they were, it was done, um, illegally and they kind of did whatever they had to do. Um, they, they spread false messages in the media, um, you know, for, for different propaganda, um, to take down these organizations. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I think that's what the writers were trying to highlight is the FBI would go through, go to drastic measures to take down, um, you know these black leaders and and organizations. The extreme measures. They would kill people, plant evidence. Yeah, yeah. Do whatever it takes to make sure these this group is dissipated. So there's one scene where you had J. Edgar Hoover <coughs> and you had the main FBI agent that was in communication with Bill O'Neill. And in that scene, he asked him, "What are you gonna do if your daughter brings a Negro home?" And they're just having a casual conversation. You can see that the FBI agent's kind of like, she's not. He's like, but no. But you could tell, you could tell. Let me ask you about it. What do you think the FBI agent was thinking? Because it was almost like he didn't want to answer the question. Because he, I feel like he, his answer wasn't going to be, or what he was thinking wasn't what the, what Edgar Hoover wanted to hear. Mm-hmm. What do you think about that? What he was thinking, um, I think in his mind, he was caught off guard. He's just, he's just like, why are we talking about my daughter? But it's like, it was it didn't even come to his mind that that his daughter would even date a black person. That's like not even in his scope. So uh, J. Edgar Hoover kind of made him realize like, yo, years down the line, if this group expands and it's a social group, so all of our children are going to see this mm -hmm. one day they might have friends with black people talk to black people have relations with black people yeah and if your daughter brings home a black man yeah how are you gonna feel about that so i took it a different way i felt like in an entire movie the fbi agent had some sort of compassion for bill o'neill whether that was just kind of like a. Uh, it was just him playing a playing a front, but it felt like he wasn't your typical FBI agent that was like, "All right, all right, nigga, you did some fucked up shit. You committed a crime. Now I own you. Now you're gonna go out here and do whatever I say." He, it seemed like he did have um, some of Bill O'Neill's interests at heart. Like, like Bill O'Neill started to say, "Yo, if I keep doing these things, I need to get paid for it." He could have just been like, "Nah." If you don't do it, you're going to jail. Mm -hmm. But he actually made sure he got compensated. Mm -hmm. To the point, they said at the end of the movie, his compensation was equivalent to about 200000 a year. Right. But I wouldn't say... I, I, I'm going to disagree with that because <laughs> J. Edgar Hoover was like, no, you need to use your informant to take them down. So it wasn't that he had any type of empathy, in my opinion, to Bill O'Neill. It was like he had to use him. So he had to be as nice as he could to make sure he got what he needed out of him to take down Fred Hampton. He had to. He, he got orders from the top. He got orders from J. Edgar Hoover to make sure his informant did what he was supposed to do. I agree. I'm not saying he was innocent in that. Of course, he was using him to infiltrate the Black Panther Party. But I think he was, I guess you could say he wasn't, I, yeah, I mean, I guess he had J. Edgar Hoover started to put the pressure on him. Mm -hmm. But I think his response in that question he asked him was almost like, the, like I don't know. It seemed like he had some type of compassion. He, he didn't come off as your, he didn't come off um, as your typical racist FBI agent. Because even in the movie, um, Bill O'Neill says he was my mentor. Mm. He looked at him as a mentor. Hmm. 
which was interesting because remember when he was in his house, he was like, yo, whatever you need, I got you. They were almost like, yeah, they had that relationship. So it was either the FBI agent was really, really good at his job and selling him on what he was doing and he was extremely persuasive or he had some type of empathy and some type of compassion. I couldn't really tell, but by that in that scene with J. Edgar Hoover, it kind of seemed like he wasn't all that bad in terms of his disdain for the black community. It seemed like he was just doing his job. Yeah, I would say that. I would say J. Edgar Hoover in the movie represented a, a pure like racist yeah. FBI agent versus this character. He was just doing his job and taking like, orders. It seemed like that. Yeah. Yeah. He wasn't. He didn't have any personal vendetta against black people or the Panther Party. He was just like, "Yo, this is my orders from up top, right? And this is what I got to do to feed my family. So right. hey, this is what you got to do, yeah. Bill O'Neill. Right. Right. You right. Know? So I, I wouldn't say he had empathy and compassion. He just didn't have any malice towards them. Right. And right. towards black people in general, he was just doing his job. Right. Exactly. Which in turn, he's taking orders from a racist. So. Right. You don't really need to be racist to take, you know what I mean? Yeah, for sure, for sure. I just, um, in that moment when he was asking, well, what are you going to do if your daughter uh, dates a black, it seemed like he didn't want to answer it because he um, didn't have the same ideologies as him. Right, exactly, yeah. Because he, because J. Edgar Hoover was like, yeah, I don't want a nigger dating my daughter. Like, right, that's right. what he, the response he wanted. Yeah, exactly. He's just like, yo. If 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 black and white people socially come together, life as we know it will be destroyed. Our livelihood, that the was way the, we the message you're trying to push, yeah. It, but he literally said those words, so it's like it's it's clear as day. We have to destroy black people so we can maintain our livelihood. Because if black people rise, we fall, and we cannot look them eye to eye. Right, right. That's right. like a do or die. We cannot look these people eye to eye. Right. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um. So that that was pretty crazy. Um, well, the one part about the movie that kind of that kind of made me that kind of I, I wouldn't say made me think, but was uh, <clears throat> was when Lil Rail came in uh-huh. and at the bar, uh-huh. and uh, I don't know why Bill O'Neill said out loud. You know, I work for the FBI. He told that the the bartender lady or whatever whoever she was but he came over who said that Lil Rel said that no Bill O'Neill said that he's because he was telling the girl at the bar because uh-huh. he was like oh I'm here alone and she's like why she's like oh I used to work for the FBI and he was like she was like oh FBI huh oh what and then she got that. up and then Lil Rel's over there just ear hustling and he comes over he's like oh you work for the FBI oh okay FBI I didn't know they was giving niggas applications can I get one and so he's like man shut up shut up and he's like, all right, look. He's like, read this article. Lifted up the newspaper, and there was that white powder in the vial. Yeah. And he was like, hey, just put this in his drink. That's all yeah. you got to do. Yeah. And you could see Bill O'Neill was like kind of confused, like, what? So he left. Lil Rel left and was like, never mind, never mind. He ran after him and was like, are you an FBI agent? Show me your badge. Show me your badge. He gave him a badge, he flipped it open, and, and it was Bill O'Neill's fake badge from the beginning of the movie when he tried to jack the car. Yeah. So he was also an FBI informant. For sure. You know, so that just goes to show the, the basis of the movie that I got is even the people's the people that are closest to you can still hurt you. And yeah, that that's kind of how it works. And you know, they even say Cointel Pro is used to this day. The propaganda, the lies, the pitting people against each other, um, you know, the legal, you know, sting operations to take down certain organizations. That still happens. And how you infiltrate a group, you have to get someone that looks like you. You have to get someone that looks like that group to infiltrate it. Right. Mm -hmm. And to get close, um, someone that speaks the same language, talks the same talk and can kind of mirror you know, whoever they're trying to infiltrate. Um, and unfortunately, that that's how it works, man. You get jammed up. It, that's how it looked. Like, so Lil Rel looked like a pimp mm-hmm. that whatever got jammed up on whatever, maybe selling drugs, pimping, whatever. And they, they, they offered him the same deal. Like, look, 
you're now an informant. Mm -hmm. So this is the little mission I'm gonna send you on. Give him, go to you know our other informant, give him some drugs. We're gonna take down Fred Hampton. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's <clears throat> it's sad because you know within the black community we we you know and thought we want to be on code, we want to be on the same page, we want to grow and help each other, but there are those certain individuals that may not feel a part of the group or the movement or the people and they get swayed to do otherwise or they get swayed to infiltrate yeah you know certain groups and as as, as much as we can clearly see that that's one of our biggest problems as a people is that everyone's not on code because we're not on code anybody can come in and act like I'm down for the movement or I'm down for the people or I'm down with whatever's going on and sabotage it. But I don't think it's not being on code. I think it's just how the system works, right? How the FBI and the justice system works is they use informants to, they use petty thieves most of the time or, you know, they create informants to take, take down the big fish, the big organizations, whether black or right, they do it right, right? They do it in the mob. You know, they, they catch people on petty charges and they look and, and they say, look, if you don't want to go to jail, I need you to do this for me. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's 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 necessary not being on code. It's just the you're going to have people that are going to snitch or work for the FBI no matter what, mm -hmm. you know, well, I in my personal belief, I believe it is being on code. I'm not going to speak on a situation, but there's a situation close to me mm -hmm. where something like that happened. Mm -hmm. And to get past that situation from what I've seen outside looking in, you have to have been on code. Otherwise, everything's going to fall apart. And that kind of don't make sense because I don't want to go into why, yeah. you know, the story I'm talking about. But from a personal experience, it is a code because if that petty thief, okay, he got caught up. Mm hmm hey bro you you did the crime do the time but is that is that a cold thing or is that just i'm a snitch but he chose to be a snitch exactly so anyone could be a snitch it's not about being on yeah, cold i guess the code is the code do not snitch then would, the, what, what code are we talking about he bill o'neill <sighs> in the movie was pretty much all about self-preservation He's being selfish. He's like, yo, I did a yeah, crime. I don't want to go to jail. I fucked up. Like most people. I yeah. don't want to go to jail, so right. I'm going to screw over somebody else so I can be straight. So, so he snitched, yeah. Yeah, so he's being selfish. So that's like, if you're if you're a part of a group, you're not on code if you're being selfish. But he wasn't part of a group, though. He, it wasn't like he was part of the Black Panther Party. True. So I, I guess I'm trying to figure out what would the code be. Is the code do not snitch? Because that is a code. It is a code. But you can also say he he wasn't snitching on his friends. He wasn't snitching on um, people that were close to him. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. He was he was snitching on people he didn't even know, and he was sold on the the idea that he was potentially doing a, a positive thing. Right. So okay, so you could say maybe. <clears throat> In that situation, okay, he's not even from the area. He comes in, he infiltrates, right? So that's actually on the Black Panthers side. They shouldn't. They should vet people. They should. And uh, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, they should. Uh, they should really thoroughly check these people that they yeah. allow in their group. It, it, yeah, the fact that he was just able to pop up like how, like you know what I mean, and get that close to the leader, that is a flaw in in your organization. You know, especially when in that scene, they, um, the guy that he tried to steal his car, he kind of mentioned the FBI because he had the FBI badge. And then they, and the girl pulled the gun out on, on him when they got in the car and pressed him like, yo, are you a, are you a, an agent? Are you a fed? Are you an informant? And he kind of finessed his way out of it. But if that comes to your attention, you got to. And what I didn't understand the whole movie, I was kind of perplexed. Like, how is this guy so close to this FBI agent? He meets up with him in public in in broad day for this long of a time, and there's no and he he doesn't get caught by anyone in the Black Panther Party. Mm -hmm. How is that even possible? Well, he almost got caught when he was with that opposing gang. 
That's what I'm saying. Yeah. And they was like, yo, that's old boy that stole my car. That's what I'm saying. So at that point, if that comes to your attention, now you got to be on his ass. Yeah. Now you got to be following him. Now you got to do some digging and you do some research yeah. to make sure he's not a fed. Especially in, in, at that time, they know they're, they're um, being targeted by the FBI. Mm-hmm. So they should know that there are going to be informants. So if he says something about the FBI, now I'm on your ass. Now, maybe you finesse yourself out of that situation, but now you can't be riding with us. You can't be that close. Right. And he got, bro, he was his driver. That's what I'm saying. So I think I think more so than being on code, because people are going to snitch. Regardless of organization, race, you can find people that will snitch and, you know, for, for their self-preservation, like you said. But I think... You can't allow that to happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So let's say when you're creating the group, you have to vet these people to make sure they will accept and abide by the code before they can even come in. Because obviously you have to be on code to be in this group. Right. And if you're not on code, you're not a part. You're not a member. And so, and there has to be uh, there has to be surveillance. Because you can you can join the group with with that intention to be part of the group, hold down the group, and be on code. But then again, you get jammed up for carrying a weapon, and now you're sitting in, in at the station, and the police officer says, "Yo, you about to get ten years for this gun? I know you you are, and you're a black par- party uh, member, so I'm gonna throw on another few years." Unless you do X, Y, and Z. You're ar- it's, this is going to be easy, too, because you're already a member. You're already a trusted member. Mm-hmm. So now I just need you to bring me back the information. So I think there has to be an ongoing surveillance. Like, yo. And that's kind of how it is. Like, yo, if, you got, if you're in a gang, right, and you get picked up by the police, and you get let out, the first thing they're going to ask, yo, how you get, get, how'd you get let out so fast? What happened? Mm-hmm. There should be tabs put on that person. Right. Because now that person who was maybe a high-ranking member or was down for the cause, just like that, is now an informant. Yeah, so that's that's a, that's a <clears throat> tough to to navigate. Like, who? Because you never know. You, you never ne- know. You, you never, never know, know when somebody got caught up and is now acting different. You know, and in the movie, you could tell, you know, Bill O'Neill... Every time he had to, you know, get information or do something, you could see the glazed look in his eyes, like, like, like oh, I'm about to do it. Like, uh, I don't want to, but I got to. Like, he just had that internal struggle. Even when uh, he had to put, you know, the powder in Chairman Fred's drink, he walked up to him. He was with his, his woman and, you know, they're eating spaghetti or whatever. And he comes up and he goes, Chairman, do you need a, a refill? On your drink? And he kind of said it weird. You know what I mean? Yeah. They didn't even show, you know, Fred's response. They just kind of, yeah, yeah. they just kind of next it him walking out. Yeah, yeah. So it's like he did it. Yeah. Right? And it's like, even in that moment, Fred trusted him so much. Even even before the hand, beforehand, it was a couple scenes before when he had the C4 in the trunk. And they were kind of butting heads a little bit. Mm-hmm. Because he was trying to push the issue, like, yo, we need to blow up the city hall or something. Dude's like, what you mean, blow up city hall? Like, no, you trying to have him kill us? So they had into a feud, and then once he, you know, fast forward, once he gets into that room with Fred and his and his lady and asked them to refill his drink, you would think Fred would be kind of like raise his eyebrow. They didn't really Why? show because they didn't really show after that blow up how they how they got cool again. Because he pretty much was like, all right, I'm out, I quit. He come he kind of quit. After that whole C4 incident. He did? I didn't look at that incident as a big incident. Damn, he charged them. They both charged them. They slammed the trunk. And they charged him like, what the fuck are you doing? Oh, really? Yeah, he charged him. Even Fred, he was like, I thought we I thought we was going to die for the people. And then as soon as as soon as soon uh, Bill O'Neill said that, Fred charged him. Like, he wanted to hit him. But the other dude grabbed him. Like, no, yeah. it ain't worth it. Yeah. So it's like that. that they showed that conflict. But they never showed how they resolved that. I think how I looked at it, because I never paid it like real. I didn't um, pay that really any mind because I feel like they were. It was just like friends having a having a disagreement and an argument, right? It was, it was. It seemed like they were so close, 
and they trusted each other whereas like they just in that moment had a disagreement so that didn't really you know what i mean because he was like you said he was in his house the next few scenes yeah and he, he so there was no real reason to not trust him he just they had a disagreement in that moment but i think what do you think i think he was trying to set him up in that moment yeah that's what he was trying to do right yeah. with the c4 yeah, yeah, he's like, yo, let's, let's, he's like, yo, we got to do this now. We got to yeah. blow up City Hall right now. And he's just like, yo, yeah, it's a little extreme, bro. Like, if we kill them, they're definitely going to kill us. Like, we're right, not right. trying to have blood right. shit on our hands. We're just right. doing it if we have to. Right, we right, got to right. go blow up nothing. Yeah. But now you're going over here talking about let's blow up City Hall. So he was just like, yo, what? what? He raised the eyebrow. Yeah. You know, and like you said, if you see something funny in the group, and people yeah. are being surveillanced out of nowhere. You got C4 in your in the trunk of your car. And now you want to go blow up City Hall in yeah. the name of the people? Yeah. I'm going to raise my eyebrow. Like, yeah. why are you so strong on this right. out of nowhere? Yeah. But, I mean, I'm sure there was a lot of people with um, extreme ideas um, like that within the within the party. So, again, I don't, I don't look that. I don't look at it as too much le as being left field, but... Um, I don't know. I think it's just sad that, you know, there there are things like Co CoinTelePro that did exist and still do exist to this day. And that the system uses poor people, disenfranchised people, people that um, kind of their backs against the wall to go in and infiltrate and bring down other criminals. Essentially. Yes, you know, it's basically it's basically it. Essentially, yeah, essentially they're using the public um, to to do their jobs. Yeah, and it's I I, I just keep getting that FBI guy's uh, face. His face is is in my head when I when I in that scene where he's just like, "Yo, you can go, and I'm gonna hunt you down." Right. You're going to do five years. Right. So, because dude wanted to bounce. He's like, yo, what you want me to do? I'm in here. I gave you the information. Yeah. Like, I'm trying to go. And, and, and you know, the uh, J. Edgar Hoover was like, yo, going to, Fred going to prison ain't enough. It's like, Huey, knew he, uh, Huey P. Newton went to prison, and he got famous. Yeah. Uh, it said Eldridge Cleaver went to prison. They had a best-selling book. Yeah. So, it's like prison is a temporary solution we need a permanent solution we need to kill him we need to kill him mm -hmm. just destroy this whole thing yeah and uh it just goes back to the just the, the deep down racist hatred yeah hatred because he because the black panther party wasn't doing anything to anybody they were literally just protecting their own right like right, right. any other group any family any american would do yeah it's interesting you say that because I, I saw a quote from jay-z he was talking about i guess nipsey hustle um and he was talking about um i think he was talking it was centered around nipsey hustle and he was just like what they don't realize is when you kill us you actually um kind of to your to the opposite of what they're trying to do you make them bigger now these people are, are touching the lives of millions now these people's spirits and story are now touching the lives of millions. So yeah, they killed him. Of course, that hurt the Black Panther Party in that moment. But I was telling my wife too. I love I love the fact that especially in this time that these stories are being are being told and are being recreated. And because um, there's a lot of them, man. It's not only the typical Martin Luther King or Malcolm X story. There's a lot of different stories. Um, in our history where, you know, we were fighting for freedom uh, and we're fighting for different things, this being one of them. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's just a, it was a powerful story um, that I wasn't really hip to. Of course, I knew the Black Panther Party and what that was and what that symbolized, but this specific story um, about Fred Hampton, the specific chapter in Pro and how the FBI assassinated him uh and used an informant to do it um is a is a, is a powerful is a powerful story 
Yeah, so, you know, like you said, uh, they thought they were going to kill the movement, but they made the movement bigger. Right. So that goes to the saying, we don't die, we multiply. Right. Yeah. You know? And and to this day, like, you, you see, uh, just like, like with Nipsey also being killed. Yeah. You know, and they're kind of saying that his situation is like the black messiah. He was the black messiah and shitty cuz was Judas. Mm. Mm. You know? And it still happens, but when Nipsey got killed, what happened? Right. More awareness. Right. More knowledge spread. More everybody's aware now. Now right. people are looking for certain things right. that they didn't see before. Yeah, yeah. And it just keeps growing. Yeah. And and that's where I think that's just the universe. That's just like the universe's defense mechanism for our people. Like, yo, you you kill one of us, five more coming back with the yeah. same mentality. Yeah, yeah. It may not be tomorrow. It might be 10, 20 years down the line, but yeah. it's going to happen. Right, right. And it's interesting because that, the you know, it's called Judas and the Black Messiah. So it mirrors, the story mirrors, um, you know, what happened in the Bible where Judas, you know, um, uh, pretty much sold out Jesus um, they say for 30 pieces of silver or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it, it's crazy. I was reading up on it. And it's literally the Jud Judas ended up killing himself. Similar to Bill O'Neill ended up killing himself um, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once, uh, yeah, Bill O'Neill killed himself once. That documentary where he did it, his only interview afterwards, yeah. after the fact, the day it aired, he committed suicide. Yeah, which was interesting because I felt like I wasn't expecting that when they started putting like the the information up on the screen because just before that, I think the interviewer must, must have asked him like, "How do you feel? You know, or, or would you have done something differently? Or how do you feel in, in your role of you know essentially taking down the Black Panther Party and getting Frank Hampton killed?" His response was pretty interesting. It was like, mm -hmm. "Well, at least I had a perspective." Mm -hmm. I was in the mix where a lot of people criticizing and judging me were on the sidelines um, and had no skin in the game. At least I had a, you know, I was, I was, I was a I was, part of the struggle. I was, I was a part of the struggle. I think he said that, right? Yeah, he's a I part, was a of, part the of the struggle. And I don't know how I really feel about that. Yeah. Like, it was a little weird. Yeah, so you, un you understand it. Like, all right, I got some skin in the game. I have perspective, but right. you're on the wrong perspective. You on the you on the wrong side of, of history, yeah. Yeah, you're on the wrong side, and it's like only if you knew the damage you would have done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, in the moment, you know, a lot of people don't know what's happening in the moment, but what happens in the moment creates the future. Right. And he didn't know what that would what it would lead to. Yeah. And uh, you know what the interview I think was in like the eighties, something like that. It was like the interview with Bill O'Neill was in the 80s and I came, came out like 90, like 1990 or mm. something like that. Mm. And for him to finally hear his own interview, it made him kill himself because he just couldn't couldn't handle. Yeah, I think in that, did. in that moment, looking back on it, he was still being to your point earlier. He was still being very selfish. That was like a selfish response. And it was um, an arrogant response. And he he was responding he was being defensive mm -hmm. as well it was like well at least i was a part of a part of this this thing at least i was part of history um regardless of what side i played um and i think it, yeah it was just, he was just being defensive i think i was expecting maybe a more um thoughtful response and a more someone that apologetic maybe yeah more someone that had maybe some time to sit with what he did and could understand the magnitude of what he did to your point but you could tell he he was still stuck in the yeah he it was still he was still had that that self-preservation mindset mm -hmm. like yo i did what i did not only because i had to but yo i was getting paid it was almost like that like yo I, I was i, I was lived, i paid. lived pretty good off of this yeah, yeah. like i said the equivalent of two hundred thousand. Two hundred thousand. So he was he was he was cool. So yeah, you gotta think like, a at the beginning your 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 um your livelihood is being threatened, right? And now I have a way out, and I'm getting paid. So it's 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 now you're in this position in this predicament, but now you're also being empowered. You're given a car. You're pretty much given anything you're asked for, and you're being paid well. So it's like, yo, I'm I'm now a proud like 
informant. Like this is my profession. This is what I. This is what I do. This is what I do. Type of thing. Yeah. So if so now you're kind of coming from a place of arrogance when you're asked like, yo, how you feel about what you? Well, man, I was, I was kind of living the life. <laughs> it was living. almost like that. I had skin in the game. And you can't really tell me nothing because I was, I was I right was in there it. in the mix. I was right near. I was right next to Fred Hampton. But it's like, bro, you was a snitch. <laughs> yeah, like, you know the 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 saddest part uh, of realizing after watching the movie was realizing that Chairman Fred Hampton died at twenty one. Bro, that was that was that was crazy. Twenty one years old. It's like, still unbelievable. Like, like for real. Like. What were you doing at 21? You know what I mean? Like, I, bro, I was not, I mentally would not be ready to lead a political movement at 21 to 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 speak in power and mobilize mobilize the, ex, mobilize people to the extent that he did, and go against the system like that and go to war with the FBI and the police. Like that's that's, that's, that's crazy. A, it's crazy, but it's amazing. It's amazing, but that shows you the amount of um oppression that was the amount of oppression at that time it's like they didn't have a choice it's like their livelihood was being compromised they were being gunned down in the street they were there wasn't real opportunity at least now we've come to a place where we have a lot more opportunity right especially with technology and things like that mm -hmm. um it, it's a, it's it's easier but you got to think back in the 60s, you still have segregation. You still have very, 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 very overt racism. Um, and you have Cointel Pro. You have um, these programs meant to target the black communities, infiltrate the the black communities, disenfranchise black people, break up the family. Like, these are very much active. Like, systemic racism is very active. Mm -hmm. in these times so the opportunity is not vast so you're forced at a young age to to be a man and be a leader and do what Fred Hampton did and mobilize your people as, as a means to survive yeah. it, it brings me back to um, kind of like some Tupac vibes yeah um, first of all as he's you know saying this speech He's like, yo, I ain't going to die sipping on ice. I'm not going to die from a bad heart. Yeah. I love the people, so I'm going to die for the people. Yeah. He felt that. I felt it watching it. I'm like, yeah. damn, that's powerful. And then, but he knew he was going to die young. Oh, for sure. And then when he, uh, he was in, when he met up with the dude from the crowns, he was like, what did he say? I think the guy from the crown said something like, you bold, like you going, you going to die behind this or something like that. And he's like, he's like, if we, he said something like we going to die for the people or something like that. And he said his, his response was like, only if we were, we were so lucky. Right. Like dying for the people is, 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 is a, a badge of honor. Right. Like he's like, Hey, I know I'm going to die for my people. And yeah, only if I'm so lucky. I don't want to die from a bad heart. I want to die knowing that living old. Yeah, I want to die knowing that yo, I I, I put it on the line for my people. I, I did something. Yeah, yeah, I made the ultimate sacrifice. I want to be an old man and saying, "Damn, I didn't do anything with my life. What yeah. did my life mean?" Right. I died for my people, and I will live on forever. Right. And like I said, it, it brought me back to like Tupac, almost like the end of uh, the last song in the Kendrick Lamar album where Kendrick is having that conversation with Pac. Mm. And then Pac goes, you know, a black man only has five years to exude maximum strength in this country mm. because you don't hear any loud mouth 30 year olds. Mm. You don't hear any loud mouth black men in this country at past 30 mm. since they take the heart and soul out of you by the time you hit 30. Mm. So he's like the time to fight back is why you're still young, mm. why you still want to lift weights, why you still want to shoot back. That's true. And then once you hit that 30 spot, you've been through so much already where you're just like, I don't even want to fight no more. I'm just going to conform and just live and just stay out the way. Yeah. You know, and that was powerful because 
every situation where somebody died young, they were fighting for a cause they believed in. And they always said, I'm going to die for this. Yeah. And that manifested. Yeah. And those people lived on for, even though they've been dead 20, 30 years, you're still talking about them. Right. And they're going to be continued to talk about for the next hundred years. Right. Because that shows that, you know, it depending on, you know, if your religious, spiritual beliefs, like it, it, like at this life, it doesn't matter. It just do, doesn't matter. Why are you here? Yeah. Why are you here on in the first place? Are you gonna, are you here just to live and just to conform and do what you're told, grow old, have regrets and die? Or are you going to live in the now, fight for what you think is right right now? And it doesn't matter the outcome because, you know, you put in the work, you put in the sacrifice to make and move forward in the movement for the people at at large, for everybody. Mm -hmm. And that's I think that's the most powerful thing Mm -hmm. is 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 that you're willing to give your physical life for somebody you don't even know, somebody that may live down the street. You just said hi to, Mm -hmm. you know, but. It's just it's just such a an emotional feeling that like when you watch the movie and you get like, damn, like these people at 21 years old, at 21, he was willing to risk it all, even though he probably didn't have much because it was the 60s. But he was willing to risk his life for black people. And that can't be said enough. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's just like it's a human thing, although people, again, are not as courageous as others and brave as others to kind of speak up and put it on the line but it's like when you see people being oppressed and being disenfranchised and being um you know the system just beating them down time after time it's like it's it's almost like you can't your your being won't let you just sit there and do nothing it's like if someone punches you in the face you're gonna punch them back you know right instinctually yeah instinctually like just human instincts Mm -hmm. so i think that's just what it was and that's just what it is it's like and i and i they said that in the movie it's it's um one of the clips was rebellion is not created just because rebellion is created based on conditions we're rebelling based on our condition we're not rebelling because we have nothing else better to do. Y'all are forcing us to fight back and shoot back and punch back. Because y'all are shooting, punching, and, and you know, oppressing us. Mm-hmm. So naturally, we're just responding to the condition. Mm-hmm. While you're telling us, while you're punching me, shooting me, right, to turn the other cheek. Right. And right. just take it and conform and do what you're told. Right. But it's like, yo... Y'all don't do what you're told when it comes down to it, so why are we? Right, right. And I think the, the biggest human instinct is survival. So if you're threatening my life and my livelihood, it's only natural that I'm going to fight back. And I think there are leaders that stood up and rose up like Fred Hampton, like Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and Tupac and Nipsey Hussle. And, you know, the list goes on um, that are that use their voice and are a little bit more notable but man i'm sure there was there was thousands of millions that don't get the recognition um that had to fight back and stand up and use their voice and you know um had to had to fight oppression so fast forward to 2021 they have the new black panther party out there Mm -hmm. do you think With the Black Panther Party never dying and just reinventing itself, do you think it could have the same impact today without, you know, the history and the stories? Like, what they're currently doing today, do you think that can grab a hold of the people and and continue to march us forward? Like the Black Panther Party currently itself right now? Yeah, I, I think they call it the new the new Black Panther Party. Yeah. I mean, I'm not too familiar with um, the new Black Panther Party and what they're doing, but I'm sure, I'm sure if they're standing for the community and standing for, you know, um, the liberty of and freedom of black people, even if they're, even if they're only creating breakfast programs or, 
handing out turkeys on Thanksgiving, I think every little bit helps. Mm -hmm. You know, it takes it takes everyone doing their part, whether it be a perceived big part or small part to to push this thing forward. You know, mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's going to take one party, one organization to right the wrongs or, you know, free free black people or liberate black people i think it's going to take us all in different capacities you know working together yeah definitely i think uh it doesn't matter what your ideology is specifically say if you are like black panther party or you are a gang member in la or you are a five percent nation in new york or you're a hebrew israelite yeah you know nation is whatever whatever group you're in we're all fighting for the same thing. Right. And as long as you're fighting or you're having a message or you're doing something in your, in your community or in your families to elevate and push forward so that the next generation can have a better life and, and teach those same ideals and principles to pass it down for them to do the same thing. As long as we're doing that, we're doing our part. Absolutely. And I had this conversation with, with some of my friends when... Um, just when everything was getting crazy, when George Floyd died and Breonna Taylor died and, and things were just kind of at an all-time high and emotions were high and it's like, yo, what do we do? Like, what do we actually do because something has to be done and it's, there's not, and my whole stance was there's, there's not one thing. There's not one solution and not everyone can do the same thing. Right. Not everyone is going to needs to go out and protest and burn shit down. There's people that should be doing that and are going to be doing that. But not everyone should be doing that. Right. Right. There's people that need to be using their voice because they're 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 captivating speakers. They they're good with words, kind of like similar to Fred Hampton. And it was funny because his um, the girl came to him and said, are you a, do you like poetry? And he's like, uh, and she's like, yo, you're you you are actually a poet, but you need to use um, you need to be careful with your words, essentially. Mm -hmm. But basically, what I'm saying is, everyone has a different role to play. Even if it's you're a you're you're a father, and you're making sure you're educating your kids on the history of our people, or you're just making sure they get a solid education and they stand on principles and they stand on morals so when they go out into the world, they're a productive member of society that can lift up black people in any capacity. Maybe that's your, you know what I mean? Maybe that's your, your role to play. But I think the overarching th message is as long as we're doing something, mm -hmm. you know. And that I guess we could take that from Bill O'Neill. Even though we don't agree with the side he chose, at least he has skin in the game. I, I agree with having skin in the game, but just not the side he chose. Yeah, just yeah, do yeah. something positive. <laughs> right, exactly. Have skin in the game and do something positive. Right, have skin in the game and do something positive. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and then, you know, you move forward slowly but surely. You know, and, and also in the movie, it was interesting to see some people were there, a part of the Panther Party, they were there to clean up. They were there to cook. Yeah. They were there to make sure, you know, the guns were kept. Yeah. They were there to make sure they had a building to go and rally to. Absolutely. Everybody has a, a part. Not everybody could be a speaker. Not everybody could be in front of the camera. Not everybody exactly. can, can, can be the face. Exactly. And we don't need a face, to be real, because history has showed us that the face usually gets murdered. Mm -hmm. Usually the, the, the head of the snake gets murdered. But if we all take the initiative to do something. Yeah. Hey, they can't kill us all. To Yeah, to, to move in a positive direction. And that's with anything, right, man? You look at a basketball team, you have the starting five, you have the bench, you have the coaches, you have the assistant coaches, you have the water boys, you have the people that, um, you know, clean the facility, you have people that close the facility, you have people that work at the concession stands, you have the people that own the building, you have the GM. You, there's a, there's, a, a there's moving millions parts. of people that play different roles and parts to you know you have the sports the, the broadcasters you have the com you know what i mean mm -hmm. that play a part in having this production and show um you know go go on um so yeah man don't feel like 
you you're not doing anything you know as long as you're like we said you're doing something positive to support in any way um i think i think that's good enough definitely i can agree with that you know so uh for the review uh out of five stars what are you giving it man it's hard because it's like obviously five stars is like a flawless perfect movie mm-hmm. um so I don't think it was a flawless, perfect movie. So tell me what's imperfect so it's not getting five stars. Um, what could have been better? Oh, man, that's a, that's a good question. What could have been better is... Hmm. I think... What could have been better? That's a good question. Cause the okay, so the acting was on point. I'm a big acting acting guy. The acting has to be super good. So uh, Daniel, the guy that played uh, Fred Hampton, acting was on point. Lakeith uh, Stanfield, his acting was cool, um, but I think he was it was meant to mirror Bill O'Neill. So he probably I don't know much about Bill O'Neill, so I can't really compare it. But it seems like he did a pretty good job. So the acting was good. The writing was good. I'm a big you know. I'm big on the script and, and the writing. So that was good. The cinematography was good. Um, man. So what is it? Maybe it is a five. Okay. Maybe. I'll give, okay, a, so I'll give only, one critique. The only reason why I would say it wasn't a five, it was, it was, um, it was, there was, a, it was boring at times. Okay. Like I oh, low key towards the end fell asleep. Okay. Um, not because of the movies per se. I was also tired, but I think for it to be a five out of five, it needs to grab your attention from the beginning and hold it throughout the entire movie. Okay. So she that's had some slow parts. Yeah, some slow parts. And, and and it's funny because my wife, she was she was kind of like uh, like during the slow parts, but in the slow parts is all the where all the gems are. Yeah, and I and I like movies that are slow. Like my wife is the same thing. Like uh, nothing's happened yet, and so far, but it's like I like that stuff. I like the character. There was development. a lot of dialogue. Yeah, I like that. I like the character development. I like when I don't mind movies being slow, but I I think a, a flawless movie, even if though it's a serious movie, will have elements of comedy in it. Will make you laugh. Mm-hmm. Will make you cry. And will hold your attention and keep you at the edge of your seat through the entire movie. And that is almost impossible to do. That's why giving a movie a five and saying it's a perfect across the board, that's tough. Right. So I think it was a great movie. But was it a flawless, perfect movie? No. Nah. Okay. Okay. Well, so I give it what? A four? I give it four and a half. Four and a half. Okay, my my thing, and maybe this is probably irrelevant, but um, before I knew it was it was in, from the perspective of of Billy O'Neill, mm. I thought it was going to be Fred Hampton was going to be the, the the main character, right? Right. So I wanted to know more about him. I wanted to know know more about that group in Chicago, and also I wanted them to kind of, even if it was just for a little bit, just talk about Oakland. And talk about the movement Huey out P. there. Noon, yeah, you yeah. know, they showed like yeah, the, they the gloss over Huey P. Newton and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they just kind of went right past that, which yeah, I yeah. get it because it's it's based in it's Chicago. Not about, it was not about Huey him. Noon, yeah, yeah. But if they would have just even for five minutes, just touched on it a little bit, just yeah. to give it context, just right. to let you know this is a this movement is 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 across the country, not just in one location. Right, 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 right. You know, so because of that, I'll give it a four and a half. That's a that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, because unless you, unless you, you have to become, you have to kind of be coming in with some type of knowledge of the Black Panther Party and how it started to really um, understand what's going on, or you have to then go back and do some research. But if you don't do research prior or after, you're kind of, you don't get the full scope and understanding and the magnitude of the Black Panther Party. Definitely. Um, so that makes sense. Yeah, so solid movie. Um, four and a half stars for me and you as well. Yeah. Um, I would say I would like to have a part two, but there ain't no part two. There won't be one. Um, be one. Unless they touch on Huey and his story. That would be interesting to see if they ever 
want to make another movie and talk about the Black Panther Party in Oakland. Yeah. That would be amazing if that ever happened. Um, I would like to give shout outs to the actors, Daniel Lekoukoulia, Kulia. Yeah. Uh, Phenomenal actor. Phenomenal actor. He did an amazing Amazing job. job. He's had a lot of big, he's been in a lot of big movies and had a lot of big roles. But I think after this movie. This, he got elevated. This solidified his ability and we're going to see him. We've already seen him in a lot of big black movies. Mm -hmm. Black Panther, Get Out was huge. Uh, But this was... For Major. me, that was that stamp. Like, yeah. bro, you did, you did. You're, 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 you're that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, shout out to those brothers. Shout out to, uh, I guess, the director was Shaka King. Shaka King. Ryan Coogler. I know Ryan Coogler played a, a role in there. So, they've, you know, the movies they've they've directed have been amazing. So, uh, if you guys ever hear this, keep that going because yeah. we love the energy, we love the realness, we love the raw truth that you right. guys are displaying on film. Right. And, uh, man, just keep it coming. Yeah, and I like the different stories, man. We talked about a few episodes back just the, the, the period in time where we just kept getting those slave movies. And I was like, man, I'm tired of this. Mm-hmm. You know, so we, we want to see other black stories, other black powerful stories. Um, so, and I think right now getting these stories, man, it's just a breath of fresh air. Mm-hmm. And it feels good. Um, so, man, we appreciate you guys for bringing this stuff to the screen. Keep doing it people go out there and support these films support black film black cinema black tv black actors and actresses and directors and producers um because man these are the people that are ultimately telling our stories and giving a voice to the voiceless so yeah shout out to all you brothers and sisters out there and also the lady who played uh chairman fred hampton's girlfriend yeah she was good too she was she was in something else i couldn't put my finger on she was in power uh, the She's in power. Uh, with Jamie Foxx, the uh, uh, superhero, black superhero, where they took the pill and they got a power. Okay, I don't remember that. It's on Netflix. Okay. She was in that movie. Oh, I did see that movie, but I don't remember her in that movie. Yeah, she was in okay. that movie. Um, okay. But yeah, she did an amazing job. Her yeah. acting when, when Fred was murdered, mm. I was like, ugh. When she was like trying to keep it together? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, you knew that was hard. But that, you know that, was their, that was their whole thing. It was like, show discipline. Yeah. That was the whole Black Panther Party thing. Was you show you show discipline? Because mm-hmm. wasn't she? She was the one wilding when they uh, came in and arrested him um, while they're con- doing the the breakfast program. Right. And she he the first thing he said to her he's like show discipline. Mm-hmm. So that was her showing discipline, which was which was tough to do. Yeah. So shout out to her. I don't even know her name, but shout out I'm to her, her too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know she did her thing on screen. That that was a. Man, I just love the movies that are coming out, and and it's like it's a new. Hopefully, these movies are going to be showed in schools to kind of give the history of um, of these times in history. So I think there's a lot because when we were kids, I mean, we didn't really get shown these type of movies, but you know, you, close. You, but even though if we did, we got the old black and white movies that were whatever. Well, we got a. a, a, a a small like you heard about Black Panther, you heard about Malcolm yeah. X, but you didn't get the real story. Yeah, you got what they wanted you to know. Right, right. Or even if you did, you got like, you know, there weren't that many notable and good movies. I think now, again, with more people in Hollywood and you know more access to, you know, whatever, uh, more resources, we're able to tell our stories. Yeah, there's a rise in black films. There was sure. it was stagnant for a while. Yeah. And now there's a rise in black films and it's yeah. uh it's good to see. Yeah. It's uh it, it 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 just reaffirms what you already know about these stories. Yeah. And to see it come to life in this day and time yeah. just makes you feel good about what you already know. Yeah. You know? And cuz I was uh I think it it took them a while um to get this this movie done. I think they had been shopping it for a long time, like back in 2014. Um, so I think it was, it went to the Sundance, Sundance Film Festival first, and then it got picked up by like Warner Brothers or something like that, um, if I'm not mistaken. But that just goes to show you as well, it um, it takes a lot for, for black stories and black film to get greenlit and for our right. stories to, to, be on, to be on the big screen. So... Man, again, go out and support 
black film, black cinema, so our stories can, you know, be uh, be shared with the world. Definitely. Yeah. Actually, this movie was. I heard. I watched the interview. It was filmed in 2019, but they received the script right after Black Panther. Okay. So I don't. I don't remember the year that that Black Panther was dropped. Uh. Uh-huh. But right after that movie was dropped, they got the script about it. Or yeah. Daniel specifically got the script, and he was on. Yeah. But they filmed it in 2019, and due to COVID, they kind of had to. Yeah. chill out a little bit and then they yeah. finally rolled it out yeah but i think the writers had they had the scripts like t- since 2014 and it was supposed to get made by another director uh, i think they said uh f gary gray i don't I can't remember how to say his name but um and for whatever reason it didn't get made but i think you know it's just again it's just difficult sometimes to to get our stories to the to the big screen sometimes yeah, it helps. I guess the la- there's a lady from WB, um, a big wig at WB that was black, uh-huh. and apparently she was she's been trying to get a Black Panther Party movie yeah. going. Yeah. But uh, I guess she was she was going at it for for like a decade. But then once this got brought up and she was in power, she's like, "Let's, Let's go. do it. Let's do it. Let's make it happen." Yeah. So it was kind of a, uh, um, as as Daniel said in his interview with the Breakfast Club, he was just like, "Yo, like it was just perfect." Like yeah, it yeah. was like the, the timing of it. Like they've been wanting to do one. Oh, they did an interview with him. I gotta yeah, see. I gotta watch that. Yeah, it's watch with that. him. Yeah. And then there's another one with Shaka King. Oh, dope! I gotta yeah, watch so that. You gotta watch, I gotta watch that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, go on and support um, Judas and the Black Messiah. Great movie. Four and a half stars. Oh and a half. And I think that's a wrap, brother. That's a wrap on another episode of Driving Wild Black. Thank y'all for riding with us, and we'll see you next time. Peace. Peace.